Hi, everyone. I'm John Sullivan with 401k Specialist, and we have another great panel discussion on a very timely topic, which is 401k FaceTime, how to effectively scale one-on-one -on -one participant meetings. The value that personalized one-on-one -on -one meetings have in getting participants to their retirement goals is by now widely known, but how are they cost-effectively performed, especially at larger organizations? We have experts with us today to help figure it out, and they also happen to be top advisor by participant outcome nominees, or TAPOs as we call them. So joining me is Gerald Gwinnett with Raymond of Retirement Solutions, Joe Brummel with Strategic Retirement Partners, and Ed Jimenez with Rafa Retirement Services. We're also joined by Marta Rodriguez with JP Morgan Asset Management, and we're very proud to partner with JP Morgan Asset Management on the TAPO program. They are doing some amazing things in the area of participant outcomes, and we're excited to have Marta with us today. Today's session is interactive, so I want to mention our real-time poll function as well as chat to ask any questions you like, and we'll get to as many as we can. So we have limited time, and I want to dive right in. And Gerald, I'm going to start with you. How do you effectively scale one-on-one -on -one meetings at larger companies? John, thanks for uh, having me be part of this panel and have the Absolutely. opportunity to be surrounded by some some really great people in the industry. Um, you know, I, a, a couple points. Number one, fortunate to be part of a, a larger organization. When those opportunities come along, I've got 20 other advisors across our firm I can tap into. And, um, you know, Dealing with the, the the COVID pandemic and you know moving into uh, a, a more digitally oriented environment really accelerated things for us from the standpoint we've got advisors sprinkled across Michigan, Ohio, and Florida, but it doesn't matter where they're at. We're able to kind of pull people together, plug into uh, larger clients that that need a larger audience for us to support that. Uh, we just had a, uh, a four-day uh, benefits fair, if you will, with a client that has uh, uh, a 1,000 participants, took uh, uh, five of our advisors and organized their time over those four days to set up one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings. We're in the fourth day of that today. It's gone extremely well. Um, point number two and this may be more applicable for, for smaller advisory shops, we're actually looking at developing a, a relationship uh, with a third party that's going to allow us to tap into their resources when we're in those environments that really command uh, a, a very large audience or we don't have the, the availability of our internal advisors to help make that happen. Understood. Joe? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, John, for inviting me to be part of this as well. I appreciate it. And uh, so I actually made the move to SRP over two years ago specifically to gain better scale. So this is, this is near and dear to my heart. It's, it's something that I knew was really important. And to survive in the industry, you have to have scale going forward. It's important to recognize that what works for a small practice um, may not work for a large practice, and the same thing applies for small versus large plan cl clients, just like Gerald uh, mentioned, uh, referenced there. Scaling appears to be easy in some ways. You could say, hey, just use technology. However, achieving the effectiveness along with the scalability is, I believe, the challenge. Scalability and effectiveness usually clash with each other. So I think the real answer, if you, if you really care about outcomes, has to involve you and your people. The combination of technology and people is what helps build scalability with effectiveness. So as you contemplate how to build scale, you're going to have to consider whether you want to build it yourself or like Gerald was just mentioning, you, know, you can rent something or connect with another firm. And so you've got some examples. Um, I'll, I'll just share some examples on homegrown versus renting. We built our own automated employee education video system uh, this year, but you can rent something similar from someone else. I know there's a firm out there that does that. We just felt we could do it better and with less cost. You know, another great example, which has been out there forever, is you know, who does your employee presentations and, and handouts if you're doing employee education? We create our own. So once you decide whether you're going to build or you're going to rent things, as far as driving outcomes, 
to be more scalable, there's two additional important points I think you should be aware of. For the first point, let me use an analogy. You don't fill your garage with every possible tool to fix cars and, and then instantly call yourself a professional auto mechanic. Similarly, buying technology does not make you just as good as any other advisor with that same technology. You might think the moral of my story is to be trained in using your systems and technology. And while that's true, I would say that there's something much more significant. And that leads me to my second point here. What separates the best from others? It's process and details. You need a process to make anything work well, and it's the details that make it work better. So let me say that another way. Show me an advisor that does something to drive great participant out or good participant outcomes, say auto enrollment, individual meetings with participants or whatever. I assure you, I can improve their outcomes 100% of the time with a better process built around that activity. And what's, I think, kind of ironic is that, you know, as much as we all know as fiduciaries that process is essential to everything we do, I don't believe it gets enough attention in the industry. My theory on that is because it's too complicated to capture in a short article or a sound bite, and even more so, uh, the best processes take years to build, and advisors with those great processes don't give it away very easy. And quite honestly, I mean, it's, it's hard to give it away because it's so, so involved. Understood. Great. Marta, I'd love to bring you in uh, for the provider perspective and what you're seeing from the advisors that you work with. Definitely. Thank you um, for inviting me to participate as well in this. Um, and so this is coming from obviously other advisors that I work with and want to hear what works on their front. Obviously, with large companies, it's it's really hard to get to everyone. And I, you know, at the end of the day, I think that the ultimate great answer is a good plan design is the best way to move the needle. And then from there, obviously, group education is really important. Um, but the obviously the best way, of course, is on those one um, to one participant meetings. Um, I have seen it where they're having group meetings where they then on, on specific topics and then they invite folks to sign up for one on one meetings. And that's where you really see people actually take action. Um, also, plan sponsors that are successful at communicating use you know, multiple different channels of communication, everything from, you know, print to external websites, right? Online tools, social media, right? And definitely creative marketing. You know, the problem where it lies is that in, in the past, we, you know, plant sponsors, there's this often um, repeated opinion that has spent a, a lot, you know, last 10, 15 years really educating the same 20% of employees out there who really understand investing. These are the ones who, who, who reach out and who do participate in those group meetings, for instance. But it really is how do we reach those, you know, other 80% um, who are still, you know, a little bit clueless in regards to how do I best um, invest for the retirement. So it does come a lot into, you know, having, I think now, you know, that we're forced into this virtual world in the summer time frame here, being able to be creative as to how we reach out to these individuals through, you know, use of third party technology, as well as having access to in financial advisors to provide you know, advice one on one goes a long way to be able to help address the needs of these individual participants. Understood. I saved the best for last. Ed. Ed, we can't hear you, buddy. Uh, thanks, John. This is very interesting because this is something I've been thinking about strongly uh, for the last several years as we continue to grow. And now I'm, I'm you know, when I think about the 33,000 participants that we have in our block, and we're a small advisory firm, we're, we're five advisors and then our support staff. So, I mean, I, I could do the math. I could realize that there is no way that, you know, our team of five is going to be able to reach out to 33,000 uh, participants. So what we started doing is I'll give a couple a couple hints and a couple tips that maybe will benefit some advisors. But number one, like uh, like uh, Joe was talking about, is utilizing technology out there, third party assistance to support uh, education and one on one participation. Uh, what's very important here, again, I'm going to really emphasize what Joe was talking about is 
you can't take the advisor out of these third parties. So when we initiate a third party vendor to help with education and one-on-ones, we make sure that we're driving that whole process for the client. Uh, it, it saves us a boatload of time, but we still remain engaged with the participant and we report on the employee engagement and metrics that we're improving. The second tip that I'll give that's made tremendous impact on my participation and average savings rate is one area that we are able to help our clients with is engaging with new hires. So what we do is we train our clients that when they have a new hire, they reach out to us and we automatically set up a 30 minute meeting with every new hire to get them engaged in the plan. This probably is the most important meeting that we have because we address, number one, making sure that their savings rate is what it needs to be for their age and where they're at. Second thing that we address is making sure that they understand the plan highlights and almost every plan that we have is offering a Roth. And a lot of the younger participants should be saving in Roth so we get them to explain what's the best way to make their contributions and make sure they're maximizing maxes and uh, matches. And then the last part is making sure that their asset allocation is correct. So we get them started on the right foot and uh, and that has been making a tremendous impact on participation. Ed, actually, if I could just kind of like chime in on that. I I like your point there in how, uh, just connecting a couple of dots, you're saying you've you've got 33,000 participants or something and and then you brought up a really good example that you're you're shooting kind of with a rifle you know, where you can be most effective with these new hires or these new eligible employees. I think that's an important point to emphasize because as you're thinking about scalability, you can't be all things to all people. You have to look at how can I be most effective? How can I achieve better outcomes with the limited amount of time and and resources that you have? And as you're building scalability for your, your practice, that's a great example, Ed. Of, of how you do that. Well, well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. So we're getting a lot of uh, questions about uh, if you can name some of the third party vendors that you're working with, either in the education or the one-on-one scheduling. Um, so I, I'll throw it out there to whoever, whoever would like to just name a couple of the, uh, of the vendors. Uh, I'll start. Uh, so there's two particular vendors that we work with at RAFA. And, um, On the larger clients that are basically 100 100 participants or larger, we've been working a lot with uh, financial finesse enterprises. Uh, This is a company that was started by Liz Davidson in 1999. And one of the nice features about this particular vendor is that they do provide, uh, along with all the other bells and whistles of financial wellness platforms, they do provide uh, one-on-one consults with uh, certified financial planners. Uh, So that really helps on the scalability side of things. And then on the smaller groups that, um, you know, less than 100, uh, we've been using Questus. And one of the great things about Questus is that it's very affordable for small groups. There's no minimum charge that Financial Finesse has. So we can start, we can put this platform in a 12 life group, a 50 life group, 75 life group at a very affordable price. Anyone else? You know, Ed, Ed hit the nail on the head. We actually work with both of those organizations too, and they do a great job. Um, I, so I'll just follow up and emphasize a couple points. One is, you know, having a, a great relationship with those providers as far as being able to refer things back to you, you know, knowing where to kind of draw the line. Um, either of those organizations aren't going to be selling product or or providing advanced financial planning services. So they're going to push that back to your organization. I would also mention a lot of the record keepers are starting to weave this kind of solution into their financial wellness systems, if you will, um, dig into that with the record keeper, get, get a really good understanding of what they do, what they're going to deliver to participants, how you can engage with that. Um, you know, are they going to control the show or are they going to really be a true partner of yours in 
you know, push opportunities back to you. Um, different vendors are out there doing different things, and you really want to make sure you understand, you know, what's going to be happening between the record keeper systems and your participants. So that's that's something else to take a close look at. For the most part, at SRP, we home grow a lot of what we do. The only thing of significance that I would mention where we use a third party is uh, your money line for like an outside financial wellness provider. And even with that, I mean, I, I, I love your money line and Peter Dunn, who is the founder of that is awesome. But we do so much with, in, with employee engagement ourselves that, um, you know, there's a lot more financial wellness that we deliver just authentically through our regular programs. And, and so we haven't used a ton of your money line, uh, at least with my team. Understood. So I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, point to the poll question here. So please go out and answer. Uh, how many one-on-one -on -one participant meetings have you held in the past month? We'd love to hear from attendees. Uh, it looks like uh, one to 10 uh, is really kind of taking the lead here. Oh, no, I'm sorry, 11 to 25. So that's great. So we've talked about this a little bit, but um, you know, I still want to just maybe expand on the role of technology and how it plays uh, in the one-on-one -on -one, uh, meeting process, especially in the past six months. Uh, we assume more Zoom meetings, as Gerald mentioned, but what else? Why don't I go to, um, Marta, do you have something to say on that? Sure, definitely. I mean, Zoom meetings is is predominantly, you know, what I've seen a lot of um, advisors utilize. Um, additionally to that, you know, it, having like mini video series um, that, that are pushed out that may be on company websites um, and or, you know, to offer soundbite um, information and, and, and a clear, fun messaging. I think that's always very important. Um, also, you know, delivering messages through through YouTube videos. Maybe this is an influence of having two young sons who are constantly on YouTube, but being able to reach through that or Facebook forums or Twitters, or, you know, just different ways of reaching out to people, I think can be very effective. Um, also gamification up to a point, right? Make the learning fun. I know myself personally, I just did my annual wellness assessment yesterday and it was made up of me going along a, like a game board, essentially moving my person along to accomplish different objectives that were set out for me by my by my company. And of course, there always was the incentive um, to to have you know money going into my my health savings account as well. But it made that process a lot uh, a lot more fun and more engaging. So we can reach out um, in those types of ways to the individuals to you know to kids to get them motivated to participate. I think that goes a long way. Understood. We're getting a lot of questions um, from the attendees about uh, blue collar workers, uh, the guys out in the field, maybe uh, people driving trucks, that kind of thing. Um, how do you reach somebody who doesn't have technology or at least easy access to technology on a routine basis? Uh, why don't we go to Joe with that one? You know, blue I, I we love working with blue collar workers, you know, manufacturing groups or whatever. And you have to get in front of them. You have to make it simple and easy. And you can use technology to do that. So one of the things that we did this year is we rolled out an integrated calendar application that allows uh, participants or even plan sponsors to book meetings with us. And so then they just go in and they can, they can look at our availability. Uh, my team and I looked at, we built a whole process around this as far as when are we available you know, the messaging, the delivery of this, and, and then participants can simply book an appointment with us and they can connect with us, whether it's through a computer or their smartphone. And we know smartphones are really important these days. Almost all of those blue collar workers have a smartphone in their back pocket. Might have a few cracks in the screen, but it's in their back pocket. Right. And, and so that enables them to book a meeting with us and us to connect with them. And then beyond that, I think what's really important is that you have refined your messaging and delivery to really resonate with them. So it's for comprehension and it's for motivation. So the comprehension side, you can't use the same terminology that you would use with a doctor or a lawyer, okay? Um, you gotta understand that you know, certain words have a significant impact on participants. And then the delivery part, what I mean by that is, is you're not just a speaker, whether you're in front of a group or an individual, you should be a motivational speaker. 
And that is what's going to really get people fired up to follow through on their intended actions, whether it's to increase their savings rate, improve their investment allocation, set up their beneficiary, you name it. And so I think I just wanted to add to one thing to what Joe just mentioned, and, and that is those are all really great things. And another thing that we found with the blue collar workforce is that plan design is very important. Uh, with our blue collar workforce is automatic enrollment, automatic escalation, um, really helps to counteract the inertia and the sometimes difficulty in actually ac accessing them because of the way they work. Hey, John, I'll also mention one quick thing. Um, we we um, implemented a process several years ago um, uh, through an organization called Retire Ready Solutions, basically producing a gap contribution analysis report for all of our participants. So we're using technology, obviously, to produce the report, but we're delivering it, um, in effect, hard copy to people. Um, you know, we'll email it, we'll snail mail it where, where, you know, people don't have access to email. The neat thing about that report is that it gets kind of the, the bare bones conversation started. What is it going to take for you to hit your retirement savings goals? Um, where are you today? What do you need to do to get there? And it's been a real conversation driver for us. It's been beautiful because it, hit, it doesn't matter where you're at. You're blue collar, white collar. I don't speak the language. I need to go through an interpreter. Whatever the case may be, it gives us a baseline to start that dialogue. And it's been powerful. Yeah, Ed Dressel at Retire Ready Solutions, a great man, great organization, so a good friend of the magazine. So this was great. So moving on, and this is going to be my favorite question, I'm sure, but do you have any memorable anecdotes that stick out about one-on-one -on -one meetings when you just knocked it out of the park and really, really helped someone? Um, Marta? Great. So, you know, I don't, obviously, in my role, do a whole lot of uh, personal one-on-one -on -one yeah. meetings, but I have in the past helps out with advisors um, that I work with uh, when it comes to doing uh, Spanish education meetings as I do speak Spanish as well. And um, what, what I found interesting was being able to, it was obviously in a group setting, but then it led to, you know, you know side, side conversations with these individuals and being able to relate to them. They had, you know, a lot of questions in regards to their benefits, how they worked, because what they hear a lot of times is what, you know, just they hear on the cooler. Right. Um, I think also when it comes to working with, you know, folks that speak different languages, um, having that available in their native languages is obviously very important. But also a lot of times typically materials are translated, you know, from English originally into different languages, but in, for instance, into Spanish. But it's good to think of doing it opposite. Right. So think of creating materials first in Spanish with the cultural context behind it to meet their needs and, and those language differences. But um, I was just surprised by the sheer level of interest and and wanting to to find out more and and so being able to 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 relate to them in that environment was was a lot of fun actually personally because we had times get removed you know I worked through, through advisors a lot but being able to meet with those individuals it's very refreshing to know these are the people that we are working for at the end of the day. Understood, Ed. So. A memorable situation. This actually just happened last week uh, with um, a new hire, and um, it, it, this is a nonprofit group. And you know, I thought this was going to be my my regular 30, 30 minute meeting, and da da da. da. And it ended up that um, she had uh, three TIA uh, CREF accounts from three prior employers with over one point five million dollars in assets to roll over into this plan. And uh, so basically part of the whole meeting was engaging her with Tia and getting the, the assets rolled over and it all happened right in this meeting. So another 1.5 million went into my retirement. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was kind of, a, it doesn't happen every day and I thought it was, it was definitely memorable. How was the paperwork on that one? There was no paperwork because, really? because you know, we've done a lot of work with Tia so we really understand how they work and we just ba basically got right in touch with the people at TIA that are going to handle this whole thing. And uh, because the account went from TIA uh, to TIA, 
uh, it was all an in an in plan transfer kind of thing. So, so. Easy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep, Gerald. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had a meeting with uh, a, a young single mother, divorced, couple kids, and she came into the meeting very uptight and, and unsure about her financial future. And by the end of that meeting, she basically left crying, giving me a hug because we were able to give her a, a vision of what the path was going to look like for her to attain her goals. She never thought she'd be able to, you know, see something out there as to what retirement could look like and what it would take for her to get there. And we were able to pretty comfortably, easily show that to her. And it just, it felt so gratifying to, to help somebody who was obviously um, pretty distressed over that, have that weight lifted from her shoulders in, in such a profound way. So it, it was pretty cool. Joe, I figure you have a lot of these, so that's why I saved you until last. So <laughs> give us a couple. You know, I will, uh, yeah, I'll give you a couple. Actually, I'm going to generalize this first one a bit. I like to use some, it's not always the success stories that have the most impact. Sometimes it is the failures. And one that stands out in my mind is, is a meeting with a participant quite a few years ago. This guy was 61 years old. He had $12,000 saved in total between him and his wife. And he made $160,000 a year in a bad year. And I had to ask, what, what's going on? And, you know, and, and there was obviously an underlying story. And what I found out is he had two kids in college, and he and his wife felt the need to pay for their kids' entire college. And after doing that, and let the kids go to whatever school, and they were not going to cheap schools. So in this situation, I tried to encourage him that you know he's got to rethink that because he was really close to retirement. He was not in great health. So who knows when he would not be able to start working or not be able to work anymore. And, and I really just tried to help him there. Quite honestly, I didn't succeed in that situation. Uh, he ended up not changing his contribution rate. He was very set in his ways. And about a year and a half, two years later, he couldn't work anymore. And lost track of them. I use that as a story with other participants that you don't want to be in that situation. You don't want to be close to retirement without a nest egg built up. And that is actually, I think, extremely powerful in helping other people. Um, the other story is kind of a funny one I'll, I'll, I'll share. And this really shows when you are connecting with your group. It was a small group. It wasn't just a one-on-one, -on -one, but there was probably about um, seven women, and I'm presenting to them, and, and um, in the middle of the meeting, the one woman pretty much asked me out, and I had my wedding ring on. Yeah, um, come on, look at you, though. You're I'm an not, Adonis here. I mean, come on. Okay, okay. No. Um, so the funny thing, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. I got really red in the face, and afterwards, the HR person gave me a whole lot of crap about it, <laughs> but that's when you really know you're resonating with a group. I guess so. All right. Awesome. Well, we're coming up on uh, the end here, but I want to just finish up with one last question, and it's kind of a fun one. What one thing would the other panelists and attendees be surprised to learn about your practice? And it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, necessarily meeting related. It could be anything. So let's start with Ed. Hmm. Well, I. Um, it's kind of interesting. You know, we've. Um, we started this practice as um, just an offshoot our, of our employee benefits uh, work, you know. And, uh, you know, and back in 1999, it's like we had no retirement plans. And one of our health insurance clients said, we want a retirement plan. So we just started, started doing uh, plans. And it was, this is basically the way we grew our practice. And then about six, seven years ago, we just decided to, you know, call it. Uh, uh, you know, our retirement name that we have now and be specialists in this field. So it's kind of interesting how the whole thing just evolved from uh, from just an offshoot of our employee benefits. Understood. Marta, what do we not know about JP Morgan Asset Management at this point? Or you? 
Well, I guess uh, personally from a technology perspective, you know, I do have two sons that are we're struggling with e-learning. So I, I feel for all the folks out there, teachers, as well as advisors in this role, having to battle with technology um, when it works, it's awesome. When not, it can be definitely um, annoying. But as far as JP Morgan side of things, uh, we have a lot of great resources when it comes to supporting those retirement conversations and just you know one quick mini plug you know there is um we have a great retirement insights program revolving around presentations um, our guide to retirement presentation but more specifically now we have a little mini series of retirement do's and don'ts in volatile markets there are you know two three four minute clips on, on a range of different topics that um a lot of advisors have found useful for for getting sound bites of information over to um participants so if you want more information on that you know feel free to reach out to to one of your jp morgan representatives so but thank you for your time yeah absolutely joe for those people who know me or whether you don't know me i'm not sure i'm going to surprise you um but one thing i'll say is that authenticity is extremely important to me it's it's just the core of everything we do from start to finish and i have a i have a little saying that uh, my kids uh, like to repeat and throw back at me all the time and it's abt always be thinking so we apply that to everything yep great and let's uh, end where we started here with gerald uh so my roots are uh i've, I've hold the uh, CPA designation and started with my firm back in 1984 on the tax side of things, quickly got introduced to the retirement plan world through the preparation of 5,500 returns. That led me to see an opportunity developing a plan administration practice. And, you know, today, what didn't exist 36 years ago in our firm has now grown to the, the encompass the entire amount of revenue the firm was generating those 36 years ago. So it's been a really neat ride seeing the evolution of this retirement plan world for Raymond. I can imagine. Yeah, wonderful. Marta, what was the name of the JP Morgan miniseries that you uh, you mentioned there? We're getting a number of questions. Uh, Yep, retirement do's and don'ts. Um, and I can go ahead and and um, it's found off of our jpmorganfunds.com website under retirement insights is where you'll find that. Fantastic, that is great. So we've got a number of questions we did not get to unfortunately, but I'm gonna send them out to the group. And if you don't mind, maybe just responding uh, in your area of expertise. So we get, you know, Tim, uh, Tammy, there was another, a number of other people who uh, still have questions, that would be great. But this was fantastic, exactly what we were looking for. So thank you so much for your time, everyone. This has uh, been really wonderful. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you John. Thanks, John. You're right. Thanks. Just a reminder that uh, yeah. the digital series continues on today at 3.30. Uh, Eastern time, and uh, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again. Take care, everybody. Thank you.